Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Psalm 98, 4 through 9. Amen, church family. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. Let's worship him. One, two. Sing praises to the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord this morning.
continue in worship. Sing this with me. Praise the Lord. chosen to worship with us this morning in person, or if you're joining us by live stream, we are delighted that you are with us. We would love to know if you're a first-time visitor, so if you are here in the sanctuary with us, there are two ways you can connect with us. You can take uh, the card that's in the pew in front of you. You can fill that out with a pen or a pencil. You can drop that in the offering plate if you'd like at the end of service, but better yet, come see me. I'll be at the next step table 
if you go out those doors, I'll be out there. I'll have a gift for you. So come see me if, uh, if you would. Or you can take out your phone, open up the camera, and just scan the QR code and fill out that digital form. Uh, but still come see me at the next step table so I can give you that gift and uh, just have a chat with you. I'd love to meet with you. Let's take a moment and pray together and ask God just to do a special work in our service today as uh, Brother Rodney uh, shares the work with us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time to uh, just be in your presence, for the time to worship you in a, a special place, Father. We uh, just ask that you come and uh, just stir our hearts uh, to hear your word. Lord, we pray for Brother Rodney as he comes and uh, just breaks the bread of life with us. Lord, we are so thankful that your mercy just is so much more than our sin. We are asking that uh, you do a great work among us today. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you, Father, for it's in your Son, Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and tell the person next to you how glad you are that they're here this morning.
Lord praise one more time. You can be seated this morning. We're going to teach you a song. And in this message series that we've been in on the whole story of Scripture, we're searching and we're looking deep and we're seeing Jesus show up all over the Bible. He's still in the miracle working business, in the saving business, in the healing business. Jesus is alive and well. And we see the work of God from cover to cover as we look at the scripture. And when we began this series, this is one of the songs that jumped off the pages for me. And it's called The Same God. And I want you to lean in as we sing this together and as you learn it with us. Because I believe this is a prayer that we can all pray because we come into this moment, into this place, in this season, as people in need. And that's what this song is about. It's about saying to God, I need you. Oh God, I need you. So let's learn it together and let's pray it together. Say 
freed the captives in your freeing hearts right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You touch the lepers then. I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. Church family, does that not make you just want to run a Baptist lap? Come on. Aren't you proud that he's the same God? And as he worked back then, he's working still. Oh, it's so good. That song's been on repeat in my truck. And I uh, love it. Love it. Thank you, choir, praise team, band for leading us. If you have a Bible this morning, and I hope you do, turn with me to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. Let me just say, uh, it, it is a joy as usual for me to have the opportunity to stand before you to open God's Word, to read, and for us to study it together uh, in Brother John's absence. Uh, let me just kind of take this moment since he's not here. He's not in the room, is he? Anybody see him? All right, good. He's probably going to watch this by live stream. <laughs> Y'all, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. And uh, I know if you're like me, you, you uh, are deeply grateful for Brother John, his leadership and his love. Um, I, I pastored for 12 years. And having the ability now to serve under uh, Brother John's leadership, I want to tell you something. Folks, we got, a, we got a pastor and a half, um, one that loves his people, uh, his shepherds, um, who sees his responsibility to feed the flock uh, with the teaching of the word um, and to, to care for his sheep. Uh, and uh, Pastor Appreciation Month gives us an opportunity to just be a blessing to him and, and to kind of give back to all in, in, in response to all that he gives uh, for us. And so I just want to encourage you uh, over the next month in some way, go buy a gift card, uh, you know, shake his hand with some money in it, you know, something, just something. But just bless him. Just let him know just how thankful you are. Now, I can get by with that because he's not in the room. Uh, but because uh, he would not want that to happen. He wouldn't want us to say that. But I'm saying it because he ain't here. All right? Genesis chapter 32. Um, I, I've been battling a cough for two days, so if my voice cracks like a, like a preteen boy, we're just going to roll with it, okay? We're not going to worry about it. Uh, and and we're, we're in a series of messages that we've, been, we, we've begun. It's going to take us uh, a while to complete, actually, 42 weeks worth. I believe that's right. Uh, through a series called The Whole Story. And uh, in that, sort of the byline of that series is that Christ in all, Christ over all. And, and, uh, and what I love, one of the things that I've always loved is in reading the Old Testament, it is how we see Jesus 
the foreshadowing, those Old Testament glimpses and pictures of the Christ in the Old Testament and how they pointed us to the coming Messiah. And then when Christ comes and his life points us back to the fulfillment of all of those things, I absolutely geek out over those things. I love it. And today's story is really no different as we talk about Jacob. Jacob and, and wrestling with God and, and, and how this kind of will take us back to help us see who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. Let me kind of set the stage for you because we're not going to read. We, we see Jacob and Esau and that whole story beginning in chapter 25 and it's going to take you through 27, 28, really all the way up to where we pick up today in 32. But obviously we can't read seven chapters. So I would encourage you to read through, catch up. But let me give you a little bit of background here. Uh, Jacob and Esau, they are twins. Esau is born first, which carries with it the blessing of the firstborn and the birthright. But when Esau comes out of the womb, Jacob is holding on to his heel. The name Jacob in Hebrew means heel grabber. But the better way to understand that name is that it also means a conniver or a con artist, a deceiver. And that's who Jacob would become. It's in the, the, the story of Jacob and Esau, we begin to see them grow and who they become. The Bible describes Jacob as a mama's boy. One commentator called him soft and tender. Wouldn't that bless your heart, guys, to be known as soft and tender? Esau was more of a daddy's boy, a hunter, strong, and hairy. Yes, I said hairy. That's going to come into play. One day Esau comes in from a hunt. He's tired and hungry. He asks Jacob for, for some of the stew that he's making. And Esau trades his birthright, sells his birthright as the firstborn for a bowl of stew. Later, Isaac, their father, getting old and feeble and his eyes are, are weak. And he's preparing to pass on the blessing to Esau, the firstborn. But Rebekah, their mother, helps Jacob deceive Isaac by putting Esau's clothes on him, putting goat hair on his arm and his neck. Now, when I say hairy, he must have been a hairy individual for goat hair to be what deceived his dad, right? But it's goat hair on his arm, his neck. Rebecca fixes some goat stew for Isaac, thinking that he is Esau. And Isaac gives his blessing to Jacob instead. He steals and deceives to claim that birthright or that blessing. Esau finds this out, makes a vow that when their father dies, that he will kill Jacob. Obviously, Jacob runs for his life. Rebecca, their mother, sends him to live with his uncle Laban, and it's there that he, he meets Rachel, he falls in love with her. He commits to work for Laban for seven years to earn her hand in marriage. After seven years, Laban tricks him and gives him Leah, the older daughter, in marriage instead. I don't know. You're thinking, well, how? Well, okay, I, don't, I don't know. That's not the point of our message today, okay? <laughs> Jacob then works another seven years for Laban to earn the hand of Rachel in marriage. And then he works another six years to earn the flock. Twenty years passes by, and Jacob then is preparing to return home. But it's not that easy. Laban pursues him from behind because Rachel has stolen his gods and has hidden them in the camel pouch. And he's also being pursued by Esau coming toward him along with 400 men. He's able to get rid of Laban, but Esau still pressing down on him, and he still has to deal with the situation. So in reality, in this moment, Jacob is having to deal with Laban, deal with Esau, and little does he know he's about to have to deal with God. More specifically, scholars believe, this is a glimpse of the pre-incarnate Christ, much like we see with uh, the, the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. It's here that Jacob does a few things. He sends gifts to sort of appease, to try to negotiate with Esau because he knows what's coming. 
He strategizes to minimize loss by dividing up his group and sending them in two different directions. In other words, if, if they attack this group, then maybe there's still something to salvage. And then he prays for God to intervene. It's interesting to note that this is his last resort, right? He does all these other things, but then he decides, maybe I should pray. In the end, Jacob is still Jacob. And that's where we pick up. Let's read this morning in Genesis 32, beginning in verse 22. It says, The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel did not eat, do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Father, we ask today that you would just bless our time. Let your word go forth and not return void, but accomplish all that you desire to accomplish. Have your way in our midst. Have your way in our hearts. Help us to be obedient and submissive to you in all things this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Just as I do with our students each week, let me give you three things to hang on to. And perhaps at the end of our time to take with you. And by the way, you notice uh, I'm wearing a student ministry t-shirt. If you look around the room, you see some of our students and, and our leaders wearing these shirts. We just said, hey, you know, this is typically the student section. And just as football season comes around, you all know there's whiteouts and redouts and blackouts. Well, we just decided we was going to like a tan out. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, Follow along with me. If you've got your, uh, your booklet there, follow along fill in, uh, and just take some notes. First thing I want you to notice from the text that we read is this. Wrestling with God brings us close to him. Wrestling with God brings us close to him. It's interesting that, that Moses records these events for us, but he doesn't say, and Jacob wrestled with God. Instead, he says that God wrestled with Jacob. Now, I know that's kind of a, a minute detail, because when there's a wrestling match, both are doing the wrestling. But it helps us understand that God has pursued Jacob, steps into this moment, and throws down with this con man, this conniver. Two times we see Jacob having uh, close encounters with God. In Genesis 28, Jacob has fled his home at the command of of Isaac and Rebekah, and he returns, and as he journeys to Haran, he encounters the Lord in a dream. And it's in this dream that he sees angels ascending and descending upon a ladder or a stairwell. And standing above the ladder in the dream is the Lord. And God is assuring him that he would be with Jacob. We see this. Let me read this for you in Genesis 28, verses 13 through 15. It says, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. 
Now clearly, it says we all would be so stirred and moved. Jacob awakens from this dream and he's excited and he names that place Bethel and he declares, God is here and I didn't even know it. I wonder how many of us live our lives. God is with us, but we live as if we've just completely forgotten it. He names the place Bethel, which means house of God. This dream, these words that God gives to Jacob were really the renewal of the covenant that God had made with Abraham prior to these events. And now in our text in Genesis 32, we see Jacob having this second encounter with God. And this time it's just a little bit different than before. Adrian Rogers says, the Lord threw him in the dirt and jumped on him. (laughs) You see, it's in these moments of quiet and solitude when we wrestle with God. We find ourselves closer to him. You see, you don't wrestle with somebody without there being some close contact. And it's in that wrestling moment that a lot of times we miss it. We, we miss. We, we just want to get out of the situation. We, we want God to work. We want God to do what we need him to do and want him to do. And we miss the point that it's in the wrestling that we're closest to the Lord. We want the outcome. And we miss the, the closeness in the moment of the wrestling It's not beyond the Lord to throw us in the dirt and wrestle with us too. And we need to be okay with those moments. Because it's in those moments of wrestling that the Lord pulls us into himself, that he might work us over and show us who he is. When we wrestle with the Lord, we're reminded that he's with us. He meets with Jacob in Bethel or Bethel, and he meets with him now in, in Peniel, and he meets with us as well. Aren't you thankful that the Lord draws near to us? Even in the wrestling that he's close. The Bible gives us many uh, descriptions of the closeness of God, that he's with us. Alistair Begg says this: He says, I am with you means practical. Help. Whatever we undertake, God is with us in the undertaking. Whatever we endure, God is with us in the enduring. Wherever we wander, God is with us in our wandering. At the end of our time together today, we're, we're going to read the Great Commission. It's on those youth fundraiser t shirts that you bought. <clears throat> Sales pitch. And behold, I am with you even to the end. Of the age. When we wrestle, he draws us close. See, we don't like the wrestling. We don't like the wrestling because we like Jacob. Sometimes we come out of that wrestling with a limp. Don't forget that it's in the wrestling that we're actually closer to the Lord. The second thing I want you to note this morning is that wrestling with God changes us. Not only does it draw us close to the Lord, but it it changes us. In verses 22 and 23, Jacob sends everyone who is left with him over the Jabbok, and he's left there alone. And the scripture wastes no time saying that when he was alone, it almost immediately he was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Commentator John Phillips says this. He says, at Bethel he saw the ladder. At the Jabbok he saw the Lord. At Bethel he became a believing man. Here he became a broken man. At Bethel he became a son of God. Here he became a saint of God. He he came away from Bethel with a new spring in his step. He came away from the Jabbok with a lasting limp in his walk. At Bethel, he died to his sin. Here, he died to himself. I think many of us would attest to those moments that we've wrestled with the Lord. In fact, some of our most intense wrestling spiritually 
isn't with the enemy as much as it is the Lord. Two of the greatest times of wrestling in our own lives, first of all, are times of difficulty. When the worry and the anxiety is so great, we wrestle with the Lord in hopes of an outcome that we so long to see come to pass. Times of difficulty. Jesus speaks to that in John chapter 16 when he says, In this life you will have trouble. Oh, we wrestle, don't we? We live in a world that is fallen, that is tainted by sin. We ourselves with a sin nature and we are constantly inundated with trouble. It's in those difficult moments that we tend to wrestle. We also wrestle in those times of decision when we're not sure what to do, where to go, what to say. We wrestle as we seek the Lord's direction in a decision. In fact, those moments of wrestling for us are often our attempt to change the Lord's mind or or to move him onto our agenda, but it's actually in those moments of wrestling, if we will allow him to, he'll change us. Rather than us trying to get God on our agenda, we begin to align ourselves with his. In verse 25, we see in the text that the man did not prevail against Jacob. In other words, God lets him win. He touches his hip and he cripples Jacob. How do we know that God let him win? Because he dislocates his hip with a touch. (laughs) If God wanted to do more, absolutely he could have. He lets Jacob prevail in this moment. And it's then that the Lord says to Jacob, Let me go. Let me go. But Jacob responds, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Notice the change. See, I'm telling you, it's in these moments of wrestling that God changes us and we begin to see the change happening. We begin in this moment to see a change happening with Jacob. He's always been a man of self-reliance. He'll gain the birthright on his own. Right? He'll, He'll steal the blessing on his own. He'll demand from Laban, Laban that he be prosperous. Like he's, he's always been the selfish, self-centered, self-reliant man that just got everything he wanted by himself. Lie, cheat, steal, deceive. That's who Jacob was. But in this moment, what is he doing? He's clinging to the only true source of blessing that there is. It's no longer about him. It's about the one he's been wrestling with. He can't steal this one, and he knows it. Only God can give it, and he doesn't want to let go. Can I just say to you that if you're wrestling, if you're waiting, if you're struggling, if you're worried and uncertain, if you're fearful, cling, (laughs) cling to the one and only source of hope and blessing available to you. Cling to Him. In Jacob's wrestling with God, we see the Lord do a couple of things. First of all, God confronts Jacob's past. He confronts his past. Notice the interaction that he has with Jacob. He asks him his name. Jacob, what what is your name? Much like the interaction that that the Lord had with Adam and Eve when he's walking along in the cool of the day in the garden and Adam and Eve have given in to temptation and they've eaten of the fruit and God says to Adam, where are you? God knew exactly where he was. He just asked, where are you? So that Adam would realize the distance that he'd placed between him and the Lord. You see, God knew Jacob's name. He didn't ask him for his own benefit. He asked him so that Jacob would have to come face to face with his past. Who are you, Jacob? And the name Jacob, you know, Jacob would have, I just can't, I imagine that Jacob would have responded this way. Oh, Lord, you know who I am. I'm heel grabber. God, I'm I'm a con man. Who are you, Jacob? 
Jake, what is your name? Well, I, God, I'm a cheater, and I'm a deceiver, and I'm a liar. That's who I am. He's not asking him what his name is. He's asking what his character is. And Jacob, in this moment, has to come clean. Leave it to the Lord to confront our past, right? It would have been this moment for Jacob that rocked his world. So this is the moment that everything shifts for Jacob. You see, not only is Jacob in this moment broken physically in the hip, oh, he's broken spiritually. Many times God will not bless us until he has first broken us. It's important that the Lord deal with our past in order to move us forward into the future he has for us. You see, God, again, God was doing two things with Jacob. He's changing his past, but he's also changing his future. In changing his heart, in changing his name, the Lord says, you're no longer Jacob, you're now Israel. And through Israel, God would establish a nation to be his own people. Through Israel, he would bring about a Savior to redeem all of mankind. He tells Jacob that that through you, all the world will be blessed. In other words, through you, through your lineage, salvation would be available to the nations. God asked Jacob his name to point out his past. He come face to face with his, with his issues. I find it interesting that when God says to Jacob, what is your name? And Jacob has to come face to face with his past, right? I just wondered if, if when Jacob then says to the Lord, then what is your name? I wonder if maybe deep down Jacob was just hoping that maybe there would be some kind of shady past that would have to be revealed to him. But instead, God doesn't give an answer. Why? Because there is no shady past. This blameless and holy God is the one that is wrestling with Jacob here. God is changing him. When we wrestle with the Lord, he changes us. He does a work in us, just as he has done with Jacob. He changes our past in order to change our future. The third thing is this. Wrestling with God blesses us. It blesses us. The blessing of Jacob isn't found in the things we often consider to be blessings. Instead, Jacob's blessing was found in his brokenness. The Lord's touched his hip and knocked it out of socket. And Jacob would forever remember what God has done. From this point forward, he would walk with a limp. He would be forever mindful of the blessing of God in his life. The moment that he came closer to the Lord and learned what it truly meant to depend on him. In fact, let's say it this way. Jacob is limping, yet walking straight for the first time in his life. Jacob is limping, but yet he's walking straight for the first time in his life. He would forever have to lean upon a crutch, physically and spiritually. Physically because of his hip, but spiritually he would finally learn what it meant to lean upon the Lord. In the hall of fame, hall of faith in Hebrews 11, the writer of Hebrews tells us this about Jacob. It says, by faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. Leaning upon his staff. You see, there are blessings in the wrestling. 
In the wrestling, we encounter the closeness of God. What a blessing it is to feel and to sense and to know that God is near. Oh, we know that He is. We, again, we, we know because we, the Scripture tells us that He's with us. He never will not forsake us nor send us back or let us go, right? He's, he's always with us. He's not going to abandon us. We know that He's near. And we lean into those things, but it's in the wrestling that we actually come to that moment where we realize God is here. He's close. Because without him, I don't think I could make it through. It's in those moments of wrestling that we encounter his closeness. And what a blessing that is. It's in the wrestling that we learn to cling to the purposes of God. When God is allowing us to wrestle and God is in the midst of that, he's, he's working in us and he's changing us and he's revealing things in our heart and our spirit that are not what, what he desires from us. It's in that that God's purpose is coming to light for us and in us. It's in the wrestling that we experience the blessing of God. His hand upon us, even when it cripples us, is still a blessing. So it's in this moment that Jacob comes face to face with God. Verse 30, he calls the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face. Coming Face-to-face -face with God often results in coming face-to-face -face with ourselves. Hear me, church. We cannot, at least we should not, be able to come face-to-face -face with a holy God and remain unchanged. Jacob encounters the Lord. He comes face-to-face -face with the living God. And it changes him. A man who his whole life has been one thing, God changes him to something better. A man whose very name means something, God has given him a new name. The very man who is about to try to re-engage and reconnect with a brother who 20 years earlier had said, I'll kill you. I'm going to kill you. When, I, when, when our father's gone, you're dead. And he's about to encounter him again. Yet this time, he's going to encounter him with a changed heart. Again, let me quote John Phillips, the commentator. He says what he says. He says, we picture Jacob fording the Jabbok leaning heavily on his staff and limping into the camp where his wives and children were in the morning light. Wives, children, he would call. And they would come running, staring at a different Jacob. What happened, they would ask. Why, he would say, I met God last night and I shall never walk the same again. Mm -mm. Listen to me. If you've met the God of heaven, you should never walk the same again. Mm. If we were to skip ahead and, and look at ch chapter 33, which we won't take time to do, I, what you're going to see is Jacob, who had sent his family ahead, steps back out in front to lead them to approach Esau. And he does so as a changed man. Rather than, rather than approaching Esau in defensiveness and, dis, and scheming and deceiving, trying to continue to be that kind of person, instead we see him humbly bow before Esau in admission of his guilt. And Esau receives him. And their relationship is restored. When's the last time you and the Lord wrestled about something? When's the last time the Lord just threw you in the dirt and jumped on you? 
Because it's in those moments that the Lord does some of His greatest work. Coming near to us, changing us. And blessing us. If you would say it's been a while, I can't tell you when the last time was that I was actually, that I sensed the Lord's closeness in my life. Oh, He ain't left you. If there's distance between you and the Lord, can I just boldly tell you something? You created it. If there's distance, you created it. He didn't. So just come home. Just come back. He's right where you left him. If it's been a while since you've wrestled with the Lord, maybe, listen, maybe this morning you're, you're in the midst of the wrestling. Maybe this morning that there's things going on in life with, with work or with children or with school or You've got decisions you're trying to make or things are really difficult. You've got a sickness or, the, or there's a parent situation or there's disease or whatever it might be. Look, in a room with this many people, there could be a multitude of various things that you're wrestling with the Lord about. But let me just tell you what the, the common denominator is in all of our wrestling with all of our difficulties and all of our decisions. The common denominator is this. Cling to Him. Cling to to him. You don't know what the outcome's going to be, just cling to him. You don't know if it's going to be what you want it to be, just cling to him. You don't know when the answer's going to be. If it's ever, you feel at the moment, it probably feels like you're never going to get a response to the answer, to the question that you have. You just need an answer. <laughs> just cling to him. This morning, I want to invite you, if you've never given your heart and life to the Lord Jesus, just as the Lord has pursued Jacob, let me remind you that he also has pursued you. One of the greatest pictures of pursuit is when God sent his one and only son to endure the cross, to pay the price for our sin that we could not pay. He's pursued you. He's pursued your heart in order to save you, to redeem you, to make you his, to adopt you into his family. He's still pursuing. Even in this room, even right now, maybe he's pursuing you. And you know that this morning there's a, there's a, a decision you need to make. There's a a moment that you need to, to lean into and go, hey, this morning I... I I want to I know that Jesus is my Savior. I want to call out to Christ by faith, and I want to be saved today. Just call on his name. Turn from your sin and turn to Jesus by faith, and he'll save you. And he'll make you a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. Maybe this morning... You're in the wrestling and you, maybe the Lord would lead you just to come and to just to bow yourself at this altar to spend some time praying and, and often wrestling with the Lord right here. I want to invite you to come. Maybe you want to grab someone and say, would you come and pray with me? But would you respond to the Lord this morning? Be obedient to him in whatever area he's asking you to. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of scripture. And we thank you that in the example of Jacob, we see that just as you've come close to him, you come close to us. And that just as you have changed his heart. Lord, you want to do that for us. I pray, Lord, today that we would be a people that is open, ready, and willing 
to receive what you have from us, Lord, and that we would do what you call us to do. That we would strive to be who you call us to be. Give us hearts of surrender and obedience to you this morning. Have your way in us and through us today. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, church family, would you just stand to your feet? And as BJ begins to sing, I want to invite you to come. You respond. You're not responding to me. You're responding to the Lord. And whatever it is he has laid on your heart to do, just be obedient. Say yes to him. Are you weary, heavy laden? Come and lay your burdens down. Jesus calls you. Jesus draws you, rest in Him. He is gentle, He is lowly, He delights to bring us peace. Tender Shepherd, mighty Savior, rest in Him. How sure His compassion. Jesus and rest in 